We've talked about a few different utilities and tools, but we got some additional ones you need to be aware of. You're watching IT Pro TV. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in to more of the Cisco CCT. That's right. I like to keep it a little bit vague. Additional <laughs> tools. Ronnie, can you tell us a little bit about the goals for this episode? Yeah, the goal for this episode is fairly simple. There are some additional tools that we don't see very often anymore, but the very fact is we still need to identify them and understand them and what they're actually doing as well. And we also need to talk about something that you probably aren't going to actually see very often unless you already are you know, doing servicing on this uh, type of equipment, which is talking about the Cisco RMA, uh, the, the process and the actions behind that and what we need to know about that as well. So Wes, earlier in our entire series, we had talked about some different cables. Mm -hmm. And I think I mentioned just about every cable that I could think of, except for one, which is this thing right here, Wes. I think we mentioned Ethernet cables. That looks like a traditional Ethernet cable. Ah, and that's the rub. It does look like a traditional Ethernet uh -oh, cable. Oh, you're going to throw a curveball at us. But it is not because of the way that these things are pinned out. Okay, uh, so my, I'm thinking this could be either a rollover cable or it could be a crossover cable, but I can't tell which one it is. All right, and the great thing is we identified what a rollover cable sure. is, which is our console cable. Okay, yeah. Uh, and actually, you can see one right here. I was... I was like, I, I saw that in the actual shot. <laughs> so we you can actually see one right here. Yep. But this is a crossover okay. cable. And one of the keys is to understand something that, Wes, most of the time in today's, when you're working with switches, you're never going to need one anymore. And that's because they do something that's called auto MDIX, okay? Mm -hmm. Which says, I don't care what the cable is. If I'm going to connect to another switch, perfectly fine. I can actually reroute it or re-switch it the way that we want to. So it automatically does it. Wait, wait a second. Now, now, hold on. There's some voodoo in there. Mm -hmm. I, there's got to be, right? So the switch actually knows what the transmit and the receive pins are and says, I'll do this for you. Yep. Oh, man, that would have saved me a lot of crimping. Yeah, it would have <laughs> saved everybody a lot of crimping. Now, even though people have absolutely go, it doesn't matter what the cable is anymore. And I agree. Okay. I still like knowing. Mm -hmm. okay? Sure. I still absolutely like knowing that I put the right cable in place. So mm -hmm. I'm not guessing whether or not it's done right. Now, people call me paranoid. Fine. I'm perfectly okay with that. But overall, though, I like ensuring that we do have something like this on hand because I never know what type of equipment I'm going to come across, okay, whether it might need it or whether or not. And even though just about everything that you've worked with probably in the last 15 years has been like that, it doesn't mean that you're always going to have that. So I always like making sure. So I always try and ensure that I have a crossover cable if I need to, especially when I'm actually working between like devices, Two routers, uh, you know, that are actually directly connecting together. Usually, you need a crossover cable. Two switches directly together. You're gonna actually need that. Or what about between a PC and a router? Mm -hmm. Yes, a crossover cable is what you'll need, and that's because of the sending and receiving pins that are in them. You know, Ronnie, the last time I'd had to use a crossover cable from the PC, we got some repurposed IP cameras where their web interface default IP address had been changed. Yeah. Uh, so we did, and, and it didn't have a reset button where we have like on home routers where you just reset it and you can look for uh, the manual. So in order to make a connection, we couldn't use it by IP. We had to do a direct connection and then kind of use the uh, MAC address to actually get in there. So I had to go, go straight from the PC's adapter right into the back of the IP camera to be able to configure it. Absolutely. So sometimes you might find out, yes, there are other devices that you might need that with mm -hmm. because there's no other way to get to them sure. besides what you talk about. So that's sure. a great example. All right, Wes, you ready for our other particular additional tools? All right, let's do it. I didn't identify the first one right. All right, I know what that is. That's a loopback. Okay? I know. That's a yeah. loopback. I, I, I couldn't have actually asked for a smaller uh, <laughs> demonstration of anything, right? That's a loopback. All right, so Wes, if that's a loopback, what is this one? <laughs> oh, now I got it. That's a green loop back and an orange loop right, back. Right, yeah. That's, that's so kind of one for that. apples and one, one for oranges? Yeah, just about. <laughs> okay. Well, I will tell you, one of the things I noticed right away when you're holding those, uh, Ronnie, and actually we had kind of been inspected yeah, we, them before, and I wanted I, to ask you is because I know what loop backs do, right? They loop back the transmit and they loop back, uh, back into the receive pin so that you can send information in and out of a physical network adapter and test it. But the one thing I noticed, Ronnie, is those those aren't traditional loop back address, or uh, ad I keep wanting to say address, but the adapter right. because they're not on the right pins. Yeah. What is all that about? Yeah, no, that's kind of the key, right? The okay. very fact is when we actually made, if we were to make a traditional loop back with Ethernet, right, sure, we just sure. go ahead and swap in the sending pins one and two and 
just make them loop into pins three and six. Three and six, sure. Okay. But Wes, these aren't that way. These though. are not that way. Okay. <laughs> this one has pins one and two looping into pins four and five. And make sure I'm actually telling you right by looking at them. <laughs> this one actually is pins one and two going into pins seven and eight. Does that sound familiar to you at all? No, not at all. Yeah. That's because we don't tend to see a lot of this anymore. Okay. And you might be wondering, so why are you covering it? Yeah, more than likely, it's because it's on the exam. Okay, okay that, sure That's pretty much what it comes down to. That would to. be a good reason. So the very fact is that you have to be able to identify both of these very clearly. Okay. Like, you know, what does pin one, uh, you know, what, what if you actually need a T1 loop back? Okay? Ah. What if you actually need a 56K loop back? You have to be able to identify those pins. The great thing is, Wes, I went ahead and I kind of asked you to pull up a web page sure. that's going to help us out. All right. So we'll actually include that in the links as well in our show notes, too. Okay. So, Wes, let's take a look at that one. All right, and then let's kind of zoom in so you can see that link. It'll be in the show notes here, but we're at Cisco Support here, and they're, we're in their documentation here. Now, Ronnie, yeah. what is it that I'm seeing here? I see loopback plugs, and I kind of see the pin outages related to here. Right. Um, so what do we got here? It's kind of the paragraph underneath, so okay. we can zoom so in on that a little down. bit. So we're scroll down, so we've got two complete these and complete these. Yep. Are these the two we're talking yep. about? So okay. So notice the first one there is actually for a T1 connector. It says CSU. DSU, what it's telling us is that this is going to mimic that, uh, that okay. idea of us testing that out. Now, there is what they call, of course, the ability to do a software loop back okay. that requires the assistance of the pr service provider okay. to help us out. Because we're actually trying to verify that the loop is happening between us and them. But if we're actually doing this on our own, we talk about a hardware loop back, we're going to use something like this. Okay. So below it actually tells us what the pinouts are. All right. You see right there on step three or whatever, C, I think is what it says there, right? Mm -hmm. Pins one and four, and then also pins two and two and five. five okay? yes, sir. So those two are actually looped together is what they're doing. So I just made these uh, probably right before the show when it comes out. So you do need to know the difference between those for that T1 is that it's pins uh, one and yeah, one and four, one and, and then four. two and yeah. five. So two this five. would be for a, a if you're like if you have a fractional T one line coming into your building and you've got one of these smart jacks and you mm -hmm. want to be able to test them physically, yep. you would use it and wire it this way. There you go. Interesting. Yep. Okay, that's what it would do. All right. And now notice the one for the fifty six K, and they show you the same steps there. But now pins one and seven are looped together, and pins two and eight are looped together as well. Okay. 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 So they describe this process. Now I wanted this particular link in here because. I can show you what these, I can tell you what these do. Mm -hmm. We're not actually doing it that way. We're just describing the pinouts. But this gives you the context of when you might use them and also how you might use them as well. So that's kind of the, the idea here, that you understand that. Make sure you pay attention to these things because it's a little bit tricky on the exam the first time you go, oh, look at that. I've never seen that before. Uh, and uh, so make sure you can identify something like that as well. Now, I got a question. Did uh, With a 56K one, did you do it in traditional 56K fashion? Did you do like the whole crazy old sound from the 90s and it takes about half a day to make the uh, the loopback cable? Knowing me, yes. Okay, you yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. there's right. no doubt <laughs> okay, uh, that's yeah. what happened there. All right, so Wes, that, that kind of does it for our hardware okay. side of things, okay? Okay. But the other thing that we also need to talk about is what we call Cisco RMA, Okay. Now, we might go, how is that a particular tool? It's a tool because it is about what happens when you have a piece of equipment that does go bad and you're still under a service contract. Well, what do you do? Okay, What you would normally do is, of course, use what we call Cisco RMA to help us. And that allows us to be, of course, to send that component back and to ensure that we get a replacement component as well for it. So on most of our devices, let me see if I can pull this out. I'm just going to use a fan as an example here, mm -hmm. okay? When a fan goes bad and everything is actually kind of that way, there's a ton of different numbers that you tend to see on these devices. So there's one on this side. There's one on this side. There's even a, a barcode right here, uh, too. I'm trying to see if there's other numbers that I can spot. No, that's pretty much about it, okay? Now, the reason why that's important is because of the idea of tracking and what information you need to include if you're going to be doing this. So, Wes, the good thing is I've, they've kind of simplified the process, but I've had you pull up uh, a, a community site that actually helps us out here. Sure. So here's the actual information that we want to understand, that they now have, of course, a new RMA process here. Mm -hmm. They talk about the RMA creation of what has happened. Notice the part information, the site information, if you're going to do this, delivery details, review and summary, or mm -hmm. review and submit. Yep. So all that's actually information that you plug in right to their particular interface that they have there. Okay. okay. That sounds fine, but here's the tricky part. 
which one of those numbers okay. do you actually use when you actually need to track this one? Okay. So, Wes, scroll down in the okay. page here, and I think we've marked it so that we can get to it easily here. There we, there go. we go. Okay. So, Wes, if we zoom in there, okay, and this is, uh, the neat thing is it's a response to a particular question. Um, so, here it is. Thank you for contacting us. There's a search section inside the RMA, and then there's drop downs that you can actually see. And here's the information that you need, right? You need to ensure that you know what your RMA number is, company name, product name. But for mm -hmm. tracking, notice that fourth bullet point there. Okay, Serial number. It is the serial number that is important. Okay. okay. So on every device that you get from Cisco, there should be a serial number. It's usually in the form of a sticker. Okay. I can even see it on the back corner of my device right over here, uh, which is that Cisco uh, switch that we have. But that's what we're looking for is the idea of the serial number that's going to help us to track that. Now, when we start talking about something like that, you might also hear the term FRU. Okay. okay what does that stand for? Field replaceable units. Field replaceable unit. Mm -hmm. There are people say, hey, there's field replaceable unit numbers too. Okay. And that may be, but the one that we're looking for here is going to be serial number. Okay. That's what we're looking for. Okay. Gotcha. So we do want to make sure that we understand that ticker idea and that placement. If we're using the Cisco RMA in terms of tracking an individual uh, component there, it's going to be using that serial number as well. All right. So having some of those hardware tools as well as understanding the process here of using the Cisco RMA, I would show it to you, but guess what? I have no service account attached to my account anymore, so I can't go in and show it to you. So in other words, if you're actually doing this for a company um, or you're actually working for uh, you know, a, a, a MSP, I was trying to remember what, what it was called, an MSP, a managed service provider, you're probably attached to their particular account you can go in and you can log into Cisco, and that would probably bring up that Cisco RMA portal for you. Because uh, I, I, uh, I was trying to think, I was like, oh, I'd love to show that, but I don't have any particular attachment to anything anymore. But to be able to show you that process. So this is the best that I can do at this particular point in, in trying to do that. But pay attention to those things. Uh, that may actually help you out. As you continue to move through that, you actually see more and more. You can track every device that you've ever put in there. In other words, history and everything else. So you name it, it's all right there and available for you. But having a knowledge of these particular types of tools in the situation that you need them and what you actually need to accomplish them is actually going to be very helpful in your CCT career. All right. And it's good to know that, too, because I've done that with other corporations that, you know, um, have that where you can put a number in there and they keep track of it over the years. And like you've seen with the equipment that Ronnie's got demonstrating here, those could sit in those uh, for a year so or years, I should say, and you uh, might find a bunch of them and maybe you can't recollect them. So it's always nice to be able to look back and see the equipment that you have. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to be it for this episode. However, stick around because we got more to come in the Cisco CCT. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.